uh, registrants who have not checked in yet, but I'm sure people will, will come online uh, once we get started. So welcome to our Asset Management Part 2 webinar, uh, Planning Ahead, presented by Walter Feedy. I just have a few housekeeping items to cover before we get started. Uh, first off, we are recording this session, which will be recorded to everyone following the webinar. We'll also be emailing you with this link a quick survey. We ask that you complete the survey so that we can continue to improve our learning series for arts facilities. Uh, thirdly, you can hear us, but we can't hear you. Your microphones have been disabled for this webinar, but you can use your speakers or headphones to listen in. And you can adjust the sound by clicking on the speaker icon at the top of the meeting. We'll have roughly 15 minutes at the end to answer questions. Uh, so you can use the chat box at the bottom right to type in your questions and we will get to as many as possible. Uh, so just to, to jump to a couple of introductions, my name is Ailey Fisher. I'm the Program and Communications Coordinator at Arts Build Ontario. In case you're not familiar with Arts Build, we are a nonprofit art service organization that provides tools, resources, and learning opportunities that help make Ontario's arts facilities more sustainable. Today we're going to hear from Kevin Nelson. Uh, Kevin is an asset management specialist with Walter Feedy, and he has nearly 15 years working in facilities management. Walter Feedy is an engineering firm based in Kitchener for over 60 years, and they are partners with Arts Build on our asset planner for the arts program. Kevin has an, uh, an interest in understanding buildings and providing recommendations to clients based on his wide-ranging professional history. He has extensive experience in many aspects of infrastructure asset management, ranging from on-site condition assessment investigations to strategic planning, policy uh, development, and hands-on fieldwork, collecting data and managing real property projects. Uh, so this experience has been gained predominantly in key consultant type roles for various clients and is a strong asset to any project team. So now I will turn things over to Kevin, uh, who will lead us through what we need to know about asset management. Uh, thanks very much, Kevin. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks very much. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, like like Elodie uh, mentioned, we're going to do a talk today about planning your asset management needs. Um, here's our quick agenda for the day. You know, what is an asset management plan? How do you make it? How do you identify your needs? And then uh, I'm going to finish up at the end with a little discussion on uh, what are some of the emerging trends in the uh, asset management, facility management world that uh, may affect you. So just a quick review. If you're with us for the part one of the, the webinar, what is asset management? It's the activities involved with getting your organization to get the maximum value out of their assets. And so an asset is an, an item or a thing that has potential or actual value to your organization. So it's your buildings, the equipment within the buildings, uh, everything related to uh, something physical that will help uh, your organization deliver, uh, meet, their, meet their program needs. Um, there are seven key questions that we follow uh, in, in Effective asset management. What do you own? Where is it? What's it worth? What condition is it in? What's the outstanding maintenance cost requirements? How much time is left in your assets and what, what should be fixed first? What are your priorities? So these seven questions, uh, you can use them. I use them all the time to guide your analysis and your decision making processes. And if you understand these ideas, then you have a really good uh, baseline to what asset management needs are. So as far as planning goes, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today comes out of the um, ISO standards for asset management. What they talk about is needing to understand your organization, how the assets fit into that organization, understand the needs and expectations of your stakeholders. And, and by stakeholders, what we mean there are your boards of directors, your, your visitors, your employees, basically anybody that has some kind of uh, impact or, 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 or involvement with using your facilities. Um, you need to understand the risks associated with any decision that gets made around your assets and facilities. And then ultimately, why we're here, you need to make a plan to effectively manage those assets. Um, a lot of it comes down to risk management, understanding what might go wrong and, and the consequences of if something goes wrong. But 
by having a good plan, you'll be uh, better prepared to, to manage those risks. Um, a little graphic here kind of to introduce this subject a little more. The idea is in the red circle at the bottom, your asset management plan falls out of all of the other parts of your, of your organization's business plan. So, you, so start at the very top, your organization should have some kind of strategic plan. Evolve that into a, a little bit of a more detailed asset management policy. Identify some asset management strategies and some key objectives, and then you'll get your asset management plan. The idea here is that the assets cannot be managed independently. They have to be uh, considered in the, in, the con in the whole context of your organization. Getting there, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's not asset specific, it's your organization should have a strategic plan, which is three key questions to get there. Where is your organization now? Where are you going? And how do you get there? So this is, like I said, this is not an asset uh, specific idea. This is a business wide, organization wide idea. The strategic plan should outline the, the vision, mission, and objectives, and, oh, pardon me, I skipped ahead. The vision, mission, mission objectives, strategies, and action plans that your organization wants to follow. Um, you put, a, for asset management, you put a bit of an asset tone to those ideas, but the key I wanna emphasize again is that you need to, the, the organization has to have uh, these, out, the, these ideas set out before you start focusing on the needs of the assets. So a typical asset management policy might include some statements like this, um, you know, mandated requirements that the, that the organization has to meet. It's a top-down idea. You have to have your boards of directors, your senior uh, people in your organization, uh, coming up and, and, and identifying their expectations and requirements. Um, you need to understand the major goals and requirements related to your assets. And most importantly, it's specific to each organization, to your organization. There's no one size fits all policy statement. You have to work within the, uh, the real world environment of your organization and your facility. Some typical example statements you might find or might use. Maximize value for money by following a disciplined decision-making process. Make sure you meet all the requirements of legislation and any codes that would affect your uh, facilities. And ensuring facilities are safe to use. The idea here is that these are high-level ideas. They're not, the details come later. The high-level ideas represent your, your vision and your the organization's mission that you want to uh, work towards and obtain. Um, key thing to, to meet, to, to, to state here, the policy does not have to be a long document, a complicated document, simpler is better. Um, you must have, you must get that buy-in and the recognition from your, your boards of directors, your, your senior, management people. If you don't have that, then when it comes time to make detailed plans about your assets, you're not going to get the support you need. So how do you get there? Um, be proactive. Go to your boards, suggest the idea of developing an asset management policy. Be ready with some examples, what you think could be included, and explain how having a sound policy that relates to the organizational strategy will help in the uh, decision making and the budgetary uh, priority making that gets done at, at later stages in, in the future as, as your asset requirements come, uh, come more clear down the road. Once you have a policy statement uh, outlined, you start working on a strategy. So you get a little bit more specific, but at the same time you're still relatively high level ideas. So identify in a strategy type document, you would identify your stakeholder needs. You'd identify how the assets 
you're responsible for will support the organization, the programming uh, role of your organization. You'll identify some uh, decision criteria, some priority making uh, strategies that you're going to use, and some performance targets you might want to uh, aim towards. You might also put in here in your strategy uh, an identification of roles and responsibilities, who's responsible for what decision making, and, and the criteria they're going to um, uh, use to make those decisions. Um, one of the key things to look at is you want to identify the needs of the, or of the organization and the assets over the wants. So you want to make sure you do what needs to be done first versus that nice to have uh, uh, desires that, that a lot of people tend to focus on. How do you get to a strategy? Um, consider things like, whoops, excuse me again. Consider things like, what's the future demand on your assets going to be? What do you think, how popular or how used are your assets going to be? And how is the organization going to get to the stage where they can properly manage those demands? Um, you look at things like, what's the condition of the assets, what's the space capacity of the assets, et cetera, and, and you account for, identify some goals that your organization wants to uh, focus on. Uh, you use a, a risk-based approach, identify potential risks to your organization and the assets. And, and also, if you remember from our previous discussion, we talked about the life cycle idea, the idea of maximizing the, the, the the lifespan of your assets at minimum costs. Uh, these are important ideas that get incorporated into a strategy. Um, again, from a, using an analogy of being in an airplane, your strategy might be that uh, 30,000 foot view. So you get an overall um, idea of what the organization wants for the assets, but not too detailed yet. The details will come later. From your strategy, you'll work on some more specific um, objectives. So we're in, using the, my airplane analogy, you're coming down a little bit lower, um, a little bit more detail, but you're still thinking here more of the bigger ideas, trying to identify the more high levels, levels of service and targets you want to reach. Um, examples for you, things like Reducing heating and hydro operating costs, uh, improving accessibility for your visitors. Um, a lot of arts facilities are in heritage type buildings, so you want to maybe identify the need to preserve historical aspects of your facilities while keeping your visitors safe. And another type of uh, objective example is improving that FCI score. Um, FCI, if you recall, is the Facility Condition Index. It's that ratio of repairs and outstanding work requirements over the replacement cost. Uh, the lower the score, the better. Um, it's it's a it's an in key performance indicator that's used to give uh, yourselves, facility managers, and your 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 boards an idea of the state of your assets. So. One objective, again, is, is there just to maybe you want to improve on that score, which means you're going to improve the condition of your assets. Once you've got that uh, these objectives identified, then you're going to go on and make your plan. So how do you do that? Let's just reiterate a little bit. Um, you're going to, the plan falls out of the organization's overall strategy the, the asset management specific policy, the strategies, and the objectives. When you identify all of those things, you get to the specific needs for the assets. Key, ident key point to uh, take note of here, the asset management plans come directly from the organization objectives. Uh, with, without that kind of direct line of sight it's referred to, uh, you're going to have problems down the road uh, convincing uh, the convincing people to provide you with your funding requests. You're going to uh, maybe not get the focus on your asset decision making that you want and need to to properly manage your assets. So this graphic 
what I want you to try and take away from it is that that idea that your asset management plan has to come directly from the top of the organization down. So within an asset management plan, what are you going to have? It's a set of ideas, clearly identifying projects related to the policies and objectives that were previously identified. What are you going to do? When are you going to do it? And roughly how much might it cost? Um, back to my airplane analogy, you're now down at the ground level. You're seeing the, the real details that you need, uh, the real in the trench kind of idea of managing a, a facility from a day-to-day -day perspective. Um, you're going to want to start with a description of the status quo of your assets. What do you have today? What, what's it worth? And what condition is it in? Uh, and most, maybe most importantly, how much is it going to cost you to bring those assets back to uh, or up to a good condition from where they might be existing? Some examples you might want to include in, a, in an asset management plan. These are just some sample statements. I tried to put a, a, a t an arts facility type tone to them. Uh, maybe you want to install new LED lights with some occupancy sensors, part of that objective of lowering your hydro operating costs. Maybe you want to install some pedestrian ramps or UA lifts. Um, Maybe there's new sound and light equipment needed for the stage areas, or, or perhaps on a bigger scale, you, you want to in, work on increasing the seating capacity in your facility. Um, these are the types of ideas you're going to see in an asset management plan. And they're going to provide you with uh, basically ammunition to go forth and, and create specific requests and identify specific cost requirements for your future needs. And ultimately, what the asset management plan does is give you that quanti quantitative justified uh, description of your needs. So to, to, to help you with that, you absolutely need data. You need to have decisions on quantitative data. Um, just saying I want it because is not good enough. You need to have evidence-based uh, you know, statistics and information to help you. Um, now, we talked last time about asset management software. Uh, if you have a small organization, you might be able to get away with a single page type spreadsheet. But as your facilities and assets grow in complexity, you're going to need more advanced software to give you the tools and analysis and historical tracking that you need to do to be able to properly make um, these kinds of decisions and to properly provide the evidence you need. Um, Software like Asset Planner, the, 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 the tool sponsored by ArtsBuild and in conjunction with uh, my company, Walter Fady, it has some real logical um, processes in it that force you to think a certain way that will give you the, the tools and the information you need um, to, 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 to make, uh, make your cases for more funding. So data, these are all graphs we talked about last, last time. Facility condition charts, your, your tabular data. These are forecast charts. That all comes from the software. Um, these are essential tools and valuable tools in being able to uh, make sound, logical plans for your facilities. Data can be overwhelming. So how do you identify specifically what your facility needs? At minimum, you need to know the size and capacity, uh, not just of your facility, but of each, each type of equipment in your facility. You need to know the age. From the age, you can make predictions on how much longer uh, you're going to have an effective life cycle of your equipment, of your asset. You need to understand your replacement costs. Um, at a minimum data level, you would want to know what systems you have within your facility. So I've described here heating, lighting, et cetera. You, any specific um, uh, stage equipment or audio visual equipment, et cetera, that your facility might have would be identified here. Um, you're going to want to know any kind of rough future plans, 
coming out of that uh, asset management policy that we discussed at the beginning, where does the organization want to go in the future? And you, and then the levels of service your organization wants to meet. So this is the minimum type of information that you would need. Uh, if you have this, you can make uh, a fairly good asset management plan. If you have a little bit more data, let's call it the good to have data, you're going to want that physical condition. Is your equipment good, fair, or poor condition? You're going to get into a little more detail beyond the system level. So I've expanded the heating system here to show you the, the individual parts that make up that system. At the minimum level, you're going to say, you know, my heating, my heating system is going to fail maybe in five to ten years. At this equipment inventory level, you're going to look at the individual pieces, and it just gives you a, bit, a little bit more precision about uh, making predictions and making cost estimates. Um, a really nice piece of data to have is what were your past or outstanding repair costs? What are your future repair costs going to be? Uh, one way to get there, to get that information, is look at how many repair calls have you made in the past. Um, if you have uh, an item that you've had to call repair technicians on, you know, every three or four months, then maybe that's telling you it's time to just replace that item as opposed to keep calling back the repair people. Um, and historical operating costs are also very valuable to have. So things like What's your uh, average hydro heating bills, et cetera? Um, they can, all that information can be used to give you an asset management plan that's a little bit more detailed than the minimum. The more detail gives you a little bit more uh, argument, a little bit more quantitative data to go forth and make uh, future requests. The best case scenario for levels of detail you would have you would identify all of every single piece of inventory in your facility. So every single every single pump, every single piece of pipe, um, you would have it down to the individual model numbers and serial numbers. That's a lot of work to get. Um, it, the more detail you get, the more costly it is. You do get a little bit more benefit because what you can do is take that information and go and do specific research and say, well, you know, model number one, two, three last has an average life cycle across use of 25 years. Ours is, our particular unit is 20 years old. So therefore, in, within five years, I can make a, a pretty a, a educated prediction that I'm going to have to replace something. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you're going to want to know your organization's approved future plans. Uh, not just rough ideas here, but we're talking more specific uh, actual actual forecasts that the organization wants to uh, work towards. You're going to want to know any legislated requirements that are existing today or that may be coming through the works. Um, often legislation impacts facility requirements. Um, the last two points here are a little bit more what we would call uh, soft information. Um, so audience, stakeholder, demographics, you know, is, is the community you're in, is the population changing, growing or, or, or decreasing? Uh, is the age of the population growing or decreasing? Is, is that going to have an impact on the audience and the visitors to your facility? Um, combined with that, technology, social, economic factors, of course, you know, um, the advent of Netflix and YouTube and things like that, has it had an impact on your facility and your organization? And are you going to have, is there a way within managing the assets to counter that to make sure that your organization still is, is popular and, and, and that you're not, um, that you don't fall out of favor with, with your visitors? Um, so all of that information can be combined together, come up with some plan uh, with your plan. It doesn't negate the need to actually go out and get visual, eyes on, hands on inspections of your facilities. Um, now again, 
If you have a small facility, a small building, you might be able to do this yourself. However, there's always outside experts available. Any reputable engineering architecture company can provide you with uh, the educated, uh, knowledgeable information about your facility. Uh, what, what, what happens is you engage them, you engage somebody, they go on site, they have a checklist of things they look for, they have a really good understanding of what what good condition is, what poor condition is, and they'll at the end of their assessments they'll present a, a report that tells you, uh, you know, identifies what you have, what needs repairing first, rough estimates of what's that going to cost, and timelines for all of that work to be done. These assessments can be really detailed, or they can be more general, and of course the level of detail impacts the cost. Um, more detailed, more expensive, obviously. The other factor to consider from your perspective as the asset managers is that super level of detail might mean for you that you get too much data and that you don't know really, you don't know what to do with it all. So um, what I wanna, uh, the takeaway I want you to have from this is that Make sure you identify the right data that you need, not just the data that uh, that the expert you hire says you're, they're going to give you. Um, I've seen too many times organizations get in the situation where they have so much data, they have such a thick report binder handed to them that they don't even know where to start with it, and, and it ends up being unused. So. Um, Make sure you work with whoever you engage to help you with your assessments, just to identify the data you need to, to get the answers and the decision-making levels uh, of information that you want. Um, I don't have it on the slide here, but um, in my past experience, there, there's really less than 10, 10 pieces of information about each equipment that are essential. And those are things like, what type of system is it? How old is it? What condition is it in? What's an estimated repair cost? Um, when is that? What's the remaining life cycle on the on the item? And when should any repairs be made? Okay, those are kind of the bare minimum of what you need. Uh, using that, you can make a, a very effective um, first level type plan for for your assets. When you get all your data, these are this is what you're going to know. Uh, a little bit of repetition here, but I, I, I want to emphasize the importance of these points. Um, you're going to know how long your assets will remain functional, that usable life cycle. You're going to want to know you're you're going to know what will need repairing right away versus what can wait. The other thing to consider is what repairs can be incorporated into potential renovation or upgrade projects that you might already have uh, identified. So in other words, uh, you may do an assessment and identify that, uh, uh, well, I saw one yesterday that some lighting fixtures aren't working properly, but you, your organization may have already identified uh, that a particular room where that light fixture is not working is going to be uh, renovated in the next year. So. There's no need to make that repair right away. Just incorporate that upgrade into that, that future renovation project. Be smart about what work you uh, identify and when you identify it. There's, there's two, there should be two phases in your asset plan, short and long-term, where short-term is from today from the day you do the assessment about to about five years out, it's the immediate problems. It's going to be fairly precise because of the short-term nature of it. You'll be able to make some pretty accurate predictions and, and an, uh, needs identification. And then you're going to have a, a long-term or a strategic plan where you look at uh, that five to 25-year uh, viewpoint. The long-term look, the long-term needs, and, and the long-term projects that uh, can be done. So instead of making repairs, you're going to make larger improvements. 
it's going to be less precise, less precise, but you're still going to be using the data you've collected, that quantitative evidence-based uh, eyes-on information that you've gathered to make these plans. Um, you need multiple phases. I've identified a short term and a long term here. Some organizations like to go short, medium, long, where medium might be that five to 10 year time frame. My recommendation is work, do what's best within the organizational context of your organization. So if, if the organization has strategic planning, you know, on an every five year cycle, uh, maybe work with, with them, work within that time frame that exists already. Uh, the real important point is you, got, you have to look short term, but you have to look that long term as well. The long term viewpoint is really what makes asset management most effective and what's going to make what's going to make your plans most effective when you go for the, the future funding requests. Related to funding, a really key point to keep in mind, as your buildings and equipment get older, they get in worse condition more quickly. So it's really slow process for something to go from excellent brand new condition to a good condition. But it's a really fast process for it to go from a fair condition down to a poor and then a critical condition. What that means financially, I said it in the last point there, right there, the older an asset or a piece of equipment is, the more money is required to maintain and to bring that asset back to good condition. Um, that's a point that a lot of organizations forget and it has huge impacts that we'll get into in a second. To counter that quickening deterioration of equipment, it's very smart to have a series of small investments because they will give more benefit than one large one. So what I mean by that, this graph shows on the bottom is your, your timeline, year zero to future. And on the vertical graph is your condition where uh, you go from uh, poor condition at the, at the bottom to excellent condition at the top. So you can see here as, it, as, as an asset is in the newer time period, it's a very slow deterioration rate of its condition. But as it gets older, that rate of deterioration gets poor. And then just around year, between year 30 and 35, what, ha what this is uh, showing is that there's been an influx of money uh, to bring that asset back up to the good condition. And then the process, the cycle starts again. Uh, this, this graph is taken from the Ontario government's building together uh, guide for asset management. Their, their number here is 60 million. Um, you know, that, that's indic indicative of a, a very major asset, but the, this process, this theory, this graph deterioration works for any, any value, any level of organization. To counter this, this situation where you let things go and then have put in one mass influx of money and then things go back downhill again, it's smarter to put in a series of small investments. So. If the blue line is a series is, is one lump sum at 60 million, what the red line shows is a, a series of $10 million investments. So what's happening? First of all, the assets never go down to the really bad condition. You're, you're constantly bringing them up through a series of small investments. The total investment value is less than that one 60 million chunk. Um, the other important thing to note here is that by doing this series of small investments, your asset never goes to complete failure. You always stay at some level of, of useful operational um, capability. Uh, now, this is a graph, uh, an example that's used throughout life cycle management planning and maintenance planning and asset management planning. Uh, it's theoretical, but it's it's been proven in use uh, through many organizations, regardless of scale. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, 
what I want you to take away from this is that uh, this idea that don't just wait for things to get really bad before you put in your, your investment to make them better. Just keep spending regularly over time and, and you'll, um, you'll, you'll ensure that your assets, uh, their, their maximum life cycle is reached without ever getting to a stage where they're um, unsafe or, or no longer meeting the capability they're, suppo they're supposed to provide. Excuse me. So just uh, just a, a, a repetition of that statement there. Regular funding through maintenance and, and repair extends the life of the assets, ultimately lowering the total life cycle cost. Um, if you can incorporate that idea into your asset management plan and make it uh, a, a part of your, da your daily operations, then that's what you should try to do. Now, once you've created an asset management plan, you can't just submit the document and walk away. You have to review them and repeat them and recreate them on a regular basis. Um, a, a good recommendation is to look relook re at your asset plans every three to five years. Any sooner than that is not really time enough to see a change in the condition of your assets. Any longer than that, any longer than that, and the changes happen uh, too great, and the, the scale of the changes are too large for you to properly plan for uh, with that regular funding injection we talked about. Um, this the key is you have to repeat with in, in regular time frames. Um, it's part of keeping your assets uh, in in good working order. And of course, the, the main benefit of an asset management plan, not the only benefit, but huge key benefit, it supports your financing requests. Good asset management plans will show that you've done your due diligence, that you're using quantitative data and, and evidence-based data, not just guesses of what you think might be needed. Um, that educated information should provide you uh, with with a better argument as you need to go forth and make uh, funding requests. Yeah. Asset management plans reduce risk as well. Um, sometimes you won't see a direct savings in, in your in your in your operational costs, for example. But you're going to reduce the risks, the, the potential. You're going to reduce the potential liabilities to your organization, and avoiding the lawyers. And that sometimes is just as or more important than actually reducing the um, physical uh, condition problems. So um, we have about, I think, about five minutes left. So I'll. Move on to some emerging trends. Uh, I don't have enough time to talk about all these in, in super detail, but I'm going to present you some ideas of what is coming in the world of asset management and things you need to be aware of. Ever-changing technology. Um, Internet of Things is a big term right now. Uh, basically, what it means is that any kind of mechanical or electrical equipment within a facility is going to be linked to the internet. Um, it's going to be controllable via internet applications. And whether you like it or not, it's going to happen. Um, to some degree, it exists already today. In a lot of buildings, you'll have multiple heating and, and cooling control uh, devices or, or, or bo multiple boilers, multiple air conditioners that are all controlled from a central building control system. It's called a, a building automation system. Um, other things that are happening is that lighting is uh, LED lighting now is sometimes uh, low power uh, and draws can be powered using uh, network cables. Uh, what that does is take away the role of the electrician and puts the uh, management of the lighting onto the network IT groups. Um, these, that's a, something I've seen happen. 
Um, the other examples are, are individual heating controls, so that if you're sitting in a, in a room in a workspace uh, and you're cold, then you just log on to a, an application on your computer or your phone and, and you say, uh, you know, increase the temperature above my desk. And there's equipment out there that does that. Um, it gives you, as an asset manager, huge flexibility in managing your building. Um, but you get a ton more data and a ton more pieces of equipment that have to be managed. So there's a trade-off between the flexibility and the, the uh, additional management needs. Of course, anything internet related, you get security risks, uh, hackers. Um, there's cases out there where uh, hackers have accessed organization financial databases via the uh, building automation systems. So these are points you need to be aware of. Um, Internet of Things is coming. Uh, in many cases, it's already in use. Uh, and so you're going to have to be aware of it. Um, operating costs, let's be honest, they're forever going to increase. So uh, how do we work within that realm? Make your building as energy smart as you can be. Make sure your equipment is properly maintained so that it's working as optimally as it can be. That means regular preventive maintenance, um, regular checks and, and, and assessments to make sure things are in good working order. Um, this link here from buildings.com. Buildings.com is an online magazine uh, related to buildings and asset management. This link tells you way better than I have time for today what some really good ideas are for um, energy solutions, energy saving solutions. So I recommend you go there. Um, one thing to keep in mind with regards to uh, energy savings, you can have all of the best, most efficient equipment in your building that's possible. But if your users and your and your building visitors and operators don't take advantage of them, you're still going to be um, paying too much money. So in other words, use the technology that's out there, but at the same time, you're going to have to implement uh, protocols for people to follow so that that technology use is maximized. Uh, other big emerging trends, green building or net zero. Um, Net zero is a term that means your building uses, your building produces as much energy as it uses, uh, you know, through things like solar panels, wind energy generation, et cetera. Um, I just learned this as part of this presentation, to be honest, but that all new housing in Ontario is going to have to be net zero by energy, by the year 2030. That will definitely trickle down into the commercial and institutional building sector, which most of you are probably uh, involved with some 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 way or another. Uh, from a federal government level, there's programs coming. Building codes are getting increasingly more strict with regards to uh, energy use and and uh, things like that. So incorporate these ideas into your future asset plan. Uh, plan for when it's time to replace your existing equipment, plan for the new equipment to be as energy as efficient as possible. Uh, maybe you want to plan to install solar panels or, or a wind turbine, and that will help you reach these net zero targets. All things to consider. Uh, and lastly, on uh, emerging trends, a um, couple small points. Building information modeling. Um, if you're familiar with AutoCAD, you know that drawings are two-dimensional. What BIM tools do, BIM is a class of software that takes a 2D building, puts it into a three-dimensional version. Most importantly, the data within the drawing is linked to a database. What's coming down the road is um, from the 3D designs that the architects produce will be a functional building management system linked to that drawing. Uh, we're, long, we're, we're a few years from that being an everyday practical use, but again, it's just an idea that's coming. And then finally, the last trend that I, I just wanted to emphasize was this idea of shared spaces, where 
your facility or, 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 or your organization may make use of, facil of a facility managed by someone else. So there's issues that need to be taken uh, into account there. Uh, how do you share operating maintenance costs? How do you share security concerns, et cetera? Um, this was explained to me by really well by someone as Airbnb for organizations. Uh, so um, it's a way, a cost savings solution for a lot of organizations. It's a way for a lot of organizations to get a space that they might not otherwise be able to. Uh, but be aware of the issues that are that come with that. So just uh, in closing and summary, um, An asset management plan that's tied to the overall strategic plan of your of your of your group of your organization helps you reduce your costs, helps facilitate funding requests, and helps you maximize the life cycle and ultimately cost savings associated with your assets. Um, to do that, you need a, a clear line of sight between all levels of the organization from the top down, so that Everybody is aware of everybody else's needs. The, the, and the needs of the assets have to be managed in coordination with the organization's financial status and with the overall strategic plan of the organization. Um, and then be aware of the emerging trends. So um, here's some uh, useful links. Uh, Again, just from time and space considerations, I don't have, I can't include everything. Institute of Asset Management is a really good uh, resource for the overall needs, the overall concept and theories of asset management. Um, ISO 55000, we've talked about, these are the standards related to asset management, basically identifying what you should do, how you might do it, and, and what are the minimum requirements to get there. Uh, that link. That there's lots of links if you search for ISO 55000 that come up, but this one I've given you is probably the easiest. If you have heritage, a heritage facility that you look after, this is one of the best links I've ever found. WBG stands for Whole Building Design Guide. It's a U.S. organization uh, evolved out of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. WBD, WBDG.org as a whole is one of the best uh, information resources you can get to anything building related. Um, and this particular page is, a, um, is very good at uh, explaining then how you operate and maintain historical buildings. And then of course, Arts Build, Arts Build Ontario, excuse me, and then uh, where you can find my company, walterfady.com. So um, that's me. If you have want to contact me, feel free. Um, and then I'll pass this over back to Elodie. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, that was awesome. So now we do have time to take some questions from participants. Uh, if you have a question, we would ask that you just type it in the chat box, uh, and then I can read it aloud, and Kevin will be able to uh, give you an answer. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and, and type them there, and we'll just wait and see if anything comes up. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone typing yet. Uh, so if a question comes to you, feel free to, to type it. Um, but uh, otherwise, if you think of any questions afterwards, you can feel free to get in touch with Kevin using the contact information on the slide here. We'll also provide this in an email uh, to you all afterwards. You can also reach out to Arts Build Ontario, and we are happy to pass questions along. Uh, in, if you're interested in learning more about Asset Planner for the Arts or would like to receive a quote uh, specific to your building, you can reach out to Alex Glass. She's the program manager here at Arts Build Ontario, uh, and her email is up there. It's alex at artsbuildontario.ca. You can learn more about the program as well as some generic pricing information on our website. 
uh, dash managing dash asset planner. Uh, as a reminder, we're also going to be sending out uh, a link with the recording of today's webinar, as well as a follow-up survey. Um, completing the survey is so appreciated. It allows us to improve future learning opportunities. So we very much appreciate your feedback. Uh, as well, we will include a link to upcoming webinars. Uh, we have an upcoming learning series webinar next week, uh, Board Relations and Capital Projects. It's at the same time, so Wednesday, uh, June 28th, 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting session, so uh, I, I encourage you to register. And you can do so at our website or on our Eventbrite page. Uh, as well, we'd like to send out a, a, a thank you to our funders, the Ontario Trillium Foundation, the Government of Canada, and the Ontario Arts Council for their support of the learning series. Okay, so that, that, is, uh, that is our presentation today. Again, I didn't see any questions come out of our chat box, but if you do have any questions, please feel free to follow up with us or Kevin. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day. Everybody, thanks for your time.